guys, look how cute. I mean, I tried. <laughs> Welcome back to Dish It Good, a series where I sit down with a very interesting person and chat with them over a delicious dish. Today I'm sitting down with the amazingly talented Ruby Wednesday. They are a performer, a cabaret artist, a singer, a songwriter, a fire breather, a tarot reader, a witch, and the owner of some spiders. A spider parent, if you will. And I hope you have a lovely watch, a lovely listen, grab a little bit of food, and let's do this. Hello, beautiful Ruby. How the heck are you over there? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm good. so, so happy to have you on today. Thank you. And we're going to chat about your amazing performance performance, you're a cabaret performer, you're a fire breather, you're a witch, tarot reader, all this good stuff. But before we get into it, let's see what you brought to eat today. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I'd make myself a nice pasta salad. So I have a pasta salad with lettuce, cucumber, tomato, um, and this Scottish delicacy, which probably not a lot of people have heard of, this is called lawn. Um, it basically looks like a square sausage. So this is like a vegan version of, of lawn. Um, oh. and then it's got some Entrevita yeast flakes on the top for a little oh, bit of fantastic. cheesy, nutty goodness. <laughs> mm, so many good textures in there. I love mm, that. Also yeah. like light and leaving you feeling good and fresh. Mm. I have a similar vibe, not in the, you know, intricacy of the preparedness, but I do have a little bit of apple slices, oh, you know, a little bit of that. She has fancy. a little bit of a peanut butter center. Oh, oh peanut butter center. Mm -hmm. I'll go wrong with the peanut butter. Yes. Cheers! <laughs> Cheers! Good health and tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Ooh. All this right. actually is great! Yeah! Yeah, apples and peanut butter is amazing. I can put anything with peanut butter and I'm like, in heaven. Yeah, about that peanut butter life, I'm not gonna lie. There have been points where I'm like, kinda wanna snack. I think that requires just a teaspoon of peanut butter straight out the jar. Oh yes. Straight in the <laughs> Sometimes, if it's like a more savory peanut butter, dip it in the sugar bowl. Ooh! <laughs> double trouble! <laughs> <laughs> yes, double trouble. Bit of salt, bit of sweet. Since I met you, literally since the day I met you, you have been singing. Okay? Yeah. Like, I saw you, you were singing, and I was like, oh, I love this person. <laughs> so, can you talk about how you specifically got into cabaret because you have so many different skill sets. I was wondering if you could speak about being a singer, being a cabaret performer and your journey of finding where you are today. So with the singing thing, I started, I mean, I've been singing since I was like this big. Um, mm -hmm. My parents tell me that they have very fond memories of me standing on the dining table and singing the Beatles. Um, oh and also getting very angry at people at infant school because they couldn't sing, they couldn't play Nowhere Man because I was singing it and they weren't playing it in of music course. lessons. So that was that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How um, dare they? <laughs> I know, rude, right? So I've been singing for a very, very long time and it's kind of just something that's just in there and comes out. It was never really sort of like a, a study or like a venture or anything. Um, it was just kind of something that existed. Um, was in a band at school uh, where I like was the lead singer and wrote lyrics and stuff. What was your band's name? We were called, uh, you can actually still find us actually, we were called The Roundabouts. Um, oh, lovely. Yeah, and we made um, like indie power pop music. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I of would love course. to grab a recording if you could maybe upload to SoundCloud. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there is a SoundCloud and I think you can just go and have a listen whenever you like. It's old school though. It's old. It's like me singing about like Pokemon. <laughs> Relevant content, okay? <laughs> yep, yep. How did I get into cabaret? Um, I kind of got into cabaret by accident. <laughs> so I studied fine art at Wimbledon College of Art and um, started exploring. A lot of my work I realised was 
portraiture and I was looking at like interpersonal and intrapersonal relationships between people, but it always centered around this concept of portraiture. And then I was like studying twins and I was studying um, alter ego and things like that. And then I made this alter ego, which is Ruby Wednesday that we all know and tolerate. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and that came about sort of accidentally because I was going to drag shows and doing sort of like Nan Golden inspired photography of, of drag queens in drag bars. And I met some drag queens who were like, come to our show this Friday. So I went to their show and then realized in that moment that I didn't really want to be sat behind that camera. I wanted to be up on that damn stage doing that stuff. Yep. So that's pretty much how, how it all sort of came about. In your process of then becoming a cabaret performer, finding Ruby Wednesday, along the road, you became a fire breather. Please oh. talk to me about that. Cause I would love to know specifically how you got into that amazing craft. I had a friend who um, was a fire breather. Well, I mean, being on the cabaret scene, like you meet so many different people. So, and you tend to move through a lot of things. So when I first started doing cabaret stuff, I was more drag and burlesque inspired. And it took a while for me to start introducing using live vocals. And I was doing lots of lip sync work where I was like crafting audio bits of art with spoken word and songs, etc., and then doing those lip sync pieces. And then it kind of gets to a point where you realize that maybe the work that you're creating might be a bit stagnant, or maybe you kind of feel like maybe everyone's doing it now. So you're like, right, what, what can I move on to? So that's when I started really focusing more on um, music and singing and cabaret music and stuff. It's a classic Gemini trait to be a jack of all trades, but master of none. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just have this uh, like constant thing where I'm like, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. And I had a friend who does fire, fire breathing and fire work and stuff. So we had a Disney show coming up and obviously I've had blue hair for fucking years now. Um, but someone was like, you probably need to do a Hades act. And I was like, can I learn fire in a week? <laughs> and it turns out I could. So Whoa. Um, <laughs> that's how I got into fire breathing and, and fire performance, um, because there was an assignment <laughs> that I had to complete. Funny, I really, really love using fire in performance. Like I really love the it feels like an extension of you in a way and it's like it's sensual and dangerous and uh mm. mystical like it really gives you that vibe of uh, back in the old days when fire was considered a gift from like the gods or whatever like it does give you that sort of like vibe um when you're using it and it because it's another element like it's an literally mm. another element that you're bringing and the audience can see it but like feel it they can literally feel the yeah. heat and that's thrilling yeah obviously it can be a little bit dangerous so oh, yeah. can you tell us about how you keep yourself safe maybe any instances where you have a little uh, scary moment here or there with the flames <laughs> <laughs> you basically need to know your shit there are different like types of fuel that are involved you can use paraffin based fuels for breathing but um a lot of people use um things like lighter fluid for their uh, wicks um, because it catches really quickly but it burns at a higher temperature um, and burns a lot faster so that's hotter than the paraffin but if you don't know those differences and you breathe fire with lighter fluid then it can follow back and go onto you oh. so that's really scary I've never done that I have seen that happen and it was really funny because I just learned like the week before um, somebody was like, never, ever, ever put lighter fluid in your mouth and breathe with it because you will die. And the week after I went to a show and a fire performer did a trick where they did a fire breath and the fire, and the, it went down the, down the like stream of lighter fluid and onto their face. And I just grabbed my friend and was like, they've got fucking lighter fluid in their mouth. You have to be aware of like, it's good to do like tests and make sure that you're comfortable wear shoes that you're not gonna fall over in, 
make sure there's nothing mm. on the stage that can catch fire or can trip you up. Make sure to treat costumes and clothes with uh, fire retardant treatments. I've had a couple of bad burns, but that's kind of it. Like I haven't had any like horror stories, uh, really. I've burnt, burnt my legs quite a lot doing, um, I was doing transfers, which is uh, where you put fuel from the wick across your body and then you light one side of it and it goes across your skin and then lights the other. If you have like too much fuel on your skin and it stays lit, then you obviously leave yourself a pretty nasty burn, but um, happens. <laughs> and in that moment, like, do, is there a way that you can get it off? How do you, if you're performing, make that go away? With my instance, it wasn't like a great big like F ton of, of fire. It was just <laughs> that I was sort of like did a thing and then it stayed lit. So you kind of just go, <laughs> make it work make yeah. It work <laughs> yeah you just have to style it out and hope for the best <laughs> i was wondering if you could talk about songwriting because you write original mm. music and if you could describe your style and your process as a songwriter as a lot of us were i suppose like when i was a kid i was a huge outcast um little queer emo kid like um so I listened to a lot of like um emo music when I was growing up and a lot of alternative music. So that's kind of where my origins of like realizing um a connection with music that was my own and yeah Green Day's American Idiot was actually the uh the gateway drug that that opened that door and then it went from that to My Chemical Romance and Marilyn Manson and Placebo and stuff so it just got started getting deeper and deeper. So a lot of my musical influence comes from that. I have uh, a person who I write with, my friend uh, Russell Lanigan, who I was coincidentally in the roundabouts with. We are writing an album together now as well. So he writes the music um, and then he, he'll like send me like little things that he's done or like um, little ideas that he's had. And then we build the music together and then I write things along with the sort of things that he's he's created musically and sometimes we meet up together and write together at the same time. I mean the work that I'm doing right now it's a concept album so it's got like a sort of through story um, and has specific relation to, to a running concept. It's very personal um, this first album like a lot of a lot of stuff but there are songs that are to do with my parents, there are songs to do with heartbreak and relationships and uh, depression, anxiety, paranoia, suicide attempts, like there's a, a lot of like really intense personal stuff like just crammed into this little album like there you go listen to that good luck. It's essentially all about journeys and, and I guess the journey of the journey of life um, and Ooh. I mean the first album is very sort of has a very sort of biographical concept to it. So you're a witch. Can you chat with me about your practices as a witch and maybe how they feed into your creative work? I study witchcraft um, extensively and have always had uh, a really interesting relationship with um, like the occult and esoteric vibes and stuff. And it wasn't until I was like 24 or 25 where I just went, oh, it's cause I'm a witch. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> um, like all of these interests as a as a kid like being really into like crystals and like different colored candles for different things and an interest in the basis of the four elements and astrology and being attracted to tarot and all these things and it it it, it took a while for me to realize that like that's where the witchcraft came from so a lot of the creativity is i guess sort of um led by witchcraft in a way because it's all kind of like energy I guess so there's yeah I guess there's this concept of always like energy and like um, little ideas sort of like flying around and then they come in and you have to like sort of take it and nurture it and grow it um, and make sure that it's healthy and lives and does the life that it's supposed to. I mean there's lots of like things that you can do like using orange candles when you're working for creativity and it's mainly about intention and focus, really. Having awareness of things coming to you from 
day-to-day -day things like a lot of people being like oh it's a gift from the universe and in the sort of basis of that is just having an awareness of noticing things and then when you have ideas being like ah, and write it down and then and really apply yourself to it but the tarot plays a huge part of my life a lot of creativity comes from that i use it to help write i'm writing a novel and writing short stories and stuff and like it's good to use the tarot to sort of like help you write things if you're feeling stuck yeah and astrology it all kind of just feeds in like little bits of stuff and obviously when I'm studying I find new things out all the time and I'm like that's really interesting I'll p apply that somewhere and yeah it's really helpful for like self-help and stuff. You're a tarot reader you were talking about energies so I was wondering if you could talk about how different maybe energies or different things that impact how you interpret the cards based on the individual person? For me personally I don't I won't really necessarily give myself a tarot reading because I find it difficult to be objective from my own experience so I always get other tarot readers to read my cards for me and also I like to be able to financially support other tarot readers around me because it's you know it's a community and there's an artistry in it and I think it should be respected and I want to give money to people who who do it for a living so I, I pay other people to read my tarot trusted sources that I have an experience with but with other people um, it's usually usually people come to a reading with questions or things that they want to know or things that they know but can't accept or don't want to hear there can be a lot of truth telling um there can be issues where that come up and you're like okay so you're really not dealing with this and you really have to it's interesting because things can come up and you can look at it and be like um okay i'm kind of getting this kind of vibe and then people are like oh my god yeah and you're just like, you're like oh okay <laughs> oh wow okay yeah it helps i think to have the essences of an empath to be able to understand what kind of situation that somebody's in um, and how they're feeling in the moment and stuff. Like I've had readings where people have had like burst into tears. I've had people that are, are very elated with it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very different experience for everybody. I think it's really important to be incredibly careful with people when you're reading tarot. I think that's one of the big things I think that, um, people can miss because without sounding like a total asshole, I think that some people come into tarot because they think it's cool, which it is, but they come into it with a sense of it being cool and it makes them look really like edgy and stuff. But I've seen readings be done to other people and have been like astounded by like what's happening in front of me and being like, you can't talk to people like that. <laughs> like, and uh, is very important to know what to do, but also what not to do, because people are, have a sense of being robust and pe other people are stronger than others, but also you need to understand that if somebody comes to you for a reading, there's probably something that they need answered or they're going through something and they want help with that. So you need to be really careful, I think. And if you're gonna do a reading and it's all like, well, all this shit stuff's gonna happen to you, there's a concept of it being like fortune telling and it's like, oh, all this awful stuff's gonna happen to you here. Buy this spell for 200 pounds and it will save you of your demons. Or just getting you to come back so they can um, get more money out of you, which is another thing, which is. <laughs> I like hearing you talk about how you, you keep growing your practice and you're always studying and you're always learning mm. to, to better yourself and to better the readings. And yeah. it's a very, ever-changing fluid process yeah. it sounds like yeah the thing with things that are like a non-dogmatic religion for example with witchcraft especially less so than wicca i think with witchcraft it's incredibly personal so you get to choose the things that are important to you and and resonate with you and are interesting for you and that's kind of similar in the way of using the tarot as well is that it's incredibly personal that usage I do feel that witchcraft and tarot usage and things like that move with the times and they're not sort of like stuck in archaic concepts like they come from base symbolism of course but what's really great about witchcraft and and things of sort of like esoteric occult nature is that they evolve with the time and they become relevant with present day rather than sort of 
keeping a very sort of outdated state of uh, mind and, and belief systems and stuff. And I think that's probably one of the greatest things about witchcraft and um, et cetera. Oh, definitely. Because I knew it had such a, like almost ancient background, mm. but to hear that it's really, yeah. and it depends on who's practicing, I suppose. Totally. But to be, you know, ready to change, ready to grow. It's just really interesting to see that it can be, um, moved into a modern time like I've read books on um, uh, witches who have read who have written books saying use your phone to help with your spell casting or use your laptop to help with your spell casting I'm like mm, genius yeah and even like having loads of forums and stuff and creating this really great online community where before witchcraft was like hidden behind doors and stuff and it was very hard to find people who were like-minded but now like it's so easily um, accessible and you can meet people online who have a similar sense of mind. I'm wondering how you're finding the transition to performing online and reading online. Basically what happened is this, I left a day job to go and perform in Australia and the day job wouldn't support me going away for such a long period of time. Um, so unfortunately I had to leave said day job to go and be a rock star in Australia. Um, like you do. Like you do, yeah. Um, so then when I came back, we went into quarantine and then there was nothing. So I didn't have a job to fall back on. I also didn't have furlough to fall back on because I didn't have a job and I'm self-employed now. Um, have been for years, but also coming back to that and then not having like the solidity or the foundation of having like um, the option to have furlough. So that was a shame and it was very difficult to accept because I've been registered as self-employed for years, but having to run day jobs alongside performance things, it means that you can't put all of your energy into performance, which then meant that I hadn't made enough money through the past financial year to be financially supported by the government. Um, oh, so I was like, <laughs> I basically looked everything up and was like, well, I'm totally fucked. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's great. Thanks guys. So I was like, well, I have to, I'm going to have to do all this on my own. So I was like, what can I do that's kind of like constructive? And I, for some reason, like thrown a tarot deck into my bag when I was transitioning from London to Edinburgh. Um, I was like, I'm just going to do daily tarot readings on Instagram. Like, why not? Just to sort of like be like, here's a nice bit of positivity and a little bit of guidance for you in the morning. And one of the main reasons I read tarot is because I like to be able to help people as much as I can, um, particularly like coming from my own experience of like struggling with emotional issues and mental issues and things like that. Like I like to be able to help as much as I can um, with other people. Tarot is a skill set that I have and it's been something that I've been studying for years. So I just thought I'd do that and then accidentally created a community on Instagram Live. So now I have people who sign in every day to see me every morning um, and have their daily bit of tarot in the morning, um, which was great. And then I had somebody contact me and say, you should have a PayPal page and you should have a PayPal link so that people can tip you for this. And I was like, mm, no, I don't really know if I want to do that because I don't want to, I didn't want to sort of be like, I'm here because I want the money. Like it was never about that. But I was doing private readings where people would just book in a time with me and then we'd call on, on the phone or on the computer or whatever um, and have like an hour session or a half hour session doing a reading with somebody. And then I thought to myself with the live thing, I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to put up the PayPal link. And if people want to give something, then I just say, if you want to leave something, please do. If you don't, don't worry about it. And then people were just donating and just being like, I really want to like support you in this. And that's kind of the same with the shows. I just did a show on a Wednesday. I was like, I'll do it again next Wednesday. I'll do it again the Wednesday after. Um, and then I was talking to my dear friend, Rose Thorne, who is the director and founder of the charity Cabaret Versus Cancer. She basically organizes huge shows and auctions, all of these things to raise money for a cancer charity. So, and she's a fucking battle axe. Like the amount of work she puts into it is fucking astounding. I'm just so proud of all the work that she does and like she's getting 
computers for, for people and she's making sure that this money is going to bereaved children who have lost their parents to cancer and all these amazing things. And I was chatting to her and she was like, the charity's taken such a blow because we don't have any places to perform and we're just really like, we're not, there's no way in hell we're ever going to make the astounding amount of money that they made last year. And I was like, I'm just going to do a show and I'm just going to donate half of the money that I make to charity. And so maybe the, maybe I can send the charity like a couple of quid or whatever and stuff and just get, you know, get people involved. So I did a David Bowie special where I just sang David Bowie songs for an hour because they do a show called Ashes to Ashes with Cabaret versus Cancer, which is just David Bowie shows. And loads of performers come in and perform to a David Bowie track and they make tons of money. And I just thought I'd do this. And Rose was like, I'll get your poster made. Did the poster, raised 200 odd quid for the, for the charity. And I was like, it's fucking astounded. I was like, holy shit. And she was obviously really, really grateful as well. So I was like, right, well, looks like I'm gonna do another one. So I'm doing another one on um, the 10th of June. Oh, um, but we're doing we're doing Fleetwood Mac um, instead oh, of David Bowie. I really appreciate that you've done so many things to benefit other people, especially families oh, that are you. affected by cancer. So I absolutely love that. And the show was amazing. So I'll Thanks. definitely be there on June 10th. <laughs> yes. And you had mentioned performing in Adelaide. I was wondering if you could explain what that show was and how you mm. created that show. That show was absolutely fucking mad. <laughs> The show for, in Adelaide was actually um, a group called Blunderland, who are from New York. I just got a phone call from someone. Oh no, I got a text from uh, the producer, Eric Schmalenberger, and was just like, hey, you know you mentioned to me while we were at Glastonbury that you wanted to be like jetted off all over the world and to perform all over the world. I was like, uh, yeah, I guess so. I was just like, do you, wanna, <laughs> do you wanna come to Australia and perform at Adelaide Fringe for six weeks? I was like, uh, fuck yeah, I do. Yeah, Eric was like, we're gonna fly you out in January to New York for um, about four days to do some rehearsal. I was like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> never been to the States and never been to Australia. And then I was just flown out to New York for like three or four days and then flown out to Australia a month later to go and perform at one of the biggest fringes in the world which was just crazy. And it was basically a great big acid trip dreamscape circus show and burlesque. So there were lots of crazy naked clowns. Um, there were lots of um, incredible aerial performers. But it's produced by Eric Schmalenberger. There's a clown troupe called Fufu Ha that were there. Just Lola Carter, Blaine Petrovia, like incredible aerial artists, Piper, Marie from New Orleans was there and she's incredible. Darlinda, just Darlinda, who's one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. Just had the best, the best time. And it was a real experience to be able to go over there and do that and then sort of like helped piece the show together and stuff. So it was really exciting to be so um, creatively involved in such a huge project. Yeah. Do you think you'll go back? Is there but a chance? yeah, I could right now <laughs> if I could. Yeah, I had the best fucking time. In a way, it's perfect timing because you got to meet all those amazing people, have that experience when mm. COVID was not a thing, and yeah. now have them as part of your community when mm. we need community right now. That's beautiful. I just wish I could have seen it. <laughs> oh my god, babe, it was amazing. It was amazing. I wish you'd seen it. Just a quick one. Yeah. You are a spider parent. Can you talk to us about that for a hot second? Yeah, I can talk to you about that for a hot second. I was arachnophobic as a kid, and uh, but always had this like really weird, dark fascination with spiders. Um, and there was this pet shop um, which does uh, sells uh, tarantulas and uh, reptiles and fish and stuff. And I went in there, and they had this one tarantula that was just sat on near the desk, and I was like, oh my god, that's so beautiful. And it was just like so encapsulated and I'd go in every week just to like see this spider. Then there was this long thing where somebody put a deposit on it and then I realized how gutted I was because I really wanted to get it but I was like, can I afford to just blow a load of money on a spider? Do I actually want a spider in my life? Then that person didn't come and pick her up and then I went over and I was like, I really want to put a deposit on that spider and they were like, what, the beast, the man eater, because 
she ate two males when they were trying to breed her. And I was like, I'll take her. <laughs> yeah, it was just there and then. And I just brought her home and I absolutely adore her. And she just, she's just molted. She's like an adult sized female. Um, so she's like this big and she's just molted. So now she's getting even bigger. I had one tarantula and now I have eight tarantulas and one spider. Anybody who's interested in buying tarantulas, I wouldn't recommend it just because it's so addictive. You get one and then you're like, I want another one, just because they're so beautiful and so interesting. It's a downward spiral. It's like getting tattoos. <laughs> you get one tattoo and you're like, oh, give me another. Are you able to hold them? So funnily enough, tarantulas really aren't into it. Like it, like it has absolutely no benefit on their lives whatsoever. They don't learn to sort of get more used to it as they, as if you handle them more like reptiles do. There's, there's no real point to holding them. I have held some of them before, like when they're, when they're babies, that when they're called spiderlings. Um, like when they're little and you like, just sort of like need to move them from one pot to another or something like you just have them in their palm. I've never held Pennywise because she's a feisty bitch. She'd, she'd go no, for she's you. capable. She's, she's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You know that big interdimensional spider at the end of that film? Yeah. <laughs> that's where, well, that's where it came from. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna call her Pennywise. But yeah, she's a big bitch. She doesn't take any shit from anyone. She does this thing where she like rears up and then she'll like slap the floor to be like, absolutely fucking leave me alone. Yeah, she's fun. She hissed at me once as well. I was like, I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> um, but I've got some more spiders that are um, of a more docile species or genus. I held my Brachypalma homori, and it's very strange. They feel very light. It just feels like eight little tiny like points on your hand and you can't really feel them there. Then the Brachypalma homori molted and after she molted became all of a sudden really skittish and they actually change their, their temperaments can change each molt. So now she's like really skittish. So I'm like, I'm not fucking holding you again. Um, so really, really bizarre how they can change so like completely, like even their temperament. I have like a Gramostola Polkra and they're like really chill. They're just like, yeah, ma'am, whatever. Some people hold them. Some people think you should never hold them because they don't like it. And it's, there's a whole tarantula community. It's, it's a big deal. <laughs> oh yeah. But that's amazing that you were arachnophobic and then were like, you know what? These are actually yeah. really cool creatures. I'm gonna make them a part of my life. Yeah. I mean, they still, they still make me nervous, especially Pennywise. Like if I'm feeding Pennywise, I open the door and then she like sort of like runs anywhere or bolts as they call it, if she bolts anywhere, I'm like, oh Jesus, fuck, don't do that. <laughs> just because I don't really want a massive full size Acanthus curry geniculata just running around my fucking bedroom. Yeah, we want to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> yeah. How can people check out your performances and maybe get a one-on-one -on -one tarot reading? So the best thing to do will be to, I'm a lot better with Instagram. So if people follow me on Instagram, my handle is Mix Ruby Wednesday. Um, mix being MX, like the non-gendered title. So you can contact me there for anything. You can you can message me if you'd like a personal reading and we can have a little chat about what, about that. I do the Instagram lives every morning with the daily tarot card reading um, and it's got a lovely little community so you can come and join that. Pretty much doing shows every Wednesday night at 8pm. Obviously real life shows are on hold but I just launched my Patreon. It's b basically to support my creativity, to support what I'm doing and the projects that I'm doing. And there are certain tiers that you can sign up to and you actually become part of a community that um, has a tarot course. Um, so I'm technically teaching a tarot course on Patreon now. My music is on Bandcamp and you can find those links on my socials as well. Well, fabulous. And all of those links will be in the description below. So make sure you check out Ruby Wednesday. Ruby, my dear, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a joy and stay safe and well. Bye, honey. Bye, darling. Bye.